All right, to take the derivative of this, this is a very important lesson, the chain rule. We want to make sure that we, uh, every time we take a derivative from now on, we want to think about, uh, ask ourselves, do we need to use the chain rule? Okay, so when you look at this, you might as well bring the exponent down, subtract one from the exponent, but we have stuff going on inside here. So hopefully it would occur to you, like we, maybe we can't use that rule. Uh, the power rule by itself because something else is happening. So what we might need to do is multiply that out the long way. So if we cube that, that would be x squared plus 5, and then it, it would be another factor of this and another factor of that. So that would be x, plus five, x squared plus 5 squared. So hopefully we can kind of follow the pattern there. That would be to square the first thing, uh, multiply this times this and double it. So that would be 10x squared, and then square that. And you may want to use the area model. We draw this out, multiply this out here, and then we can put x squared and plus 5 right there. And now we could multiply out those boxes. So that would be x squared times x to the fourth is going to be x to the sixth. I'm just going to go across here. So that would be 10x to the fourth and 25x squared. And if we move down here, this would be 5x to the fourth, and uh, this times this would be 50x squared, and then we'd have 125. So if we combine these things, um, that's going to be x to the sixth plus 15x to the fourth plus 75x squared uh, plus 125. Okay. So now we can take the derivative of that. So c prime of x is going to be 6x to the fifth plus 60x cubed plus 150x. All right. Now. We may want to factor something out of here. So we can divide those all by 6x. So we'd factor out a 6x out of there. That's going to be x to the fourth plus 10x squared plus 25. Well, that looks pretty familiar. So really, that's going to be um, x squared plus 5 squared. Hmm. Interesting. Well, let's uh, leave that alone for now. So we're going to move on, and hopefully you realize or think about like that's not a very doesn't seem very efficient way to to have to multiply all that out. So what we're going to learn is there's a way we can get to here without doing all of this stuff. All right. But before we do that, we just want to go over composite uh, functions here, decomposing functions. <laughs> So um, this is for when you have a function inside of another function. And so what you want to think of here kind of is uh, inside versus outside. So let's go uh, inside and outside. Okay. So if you think about the inside function here, so if you look at this, and you could probably pause this and fill this whole thing out. Uh, or if you want to watch the first one and then pause it and do the rest, that's fine. So I hope it's pretty clear the inside function is going to be x squared plus 1. And so we're going to call that u, or g of x is equal to that, and so that's u. So now we're going to replace that with u, so then we're going to have the outer function. So that's going to be the square root of u. Okay, so pause and do the rest of those. Um, so hopefully you pause and you're coming back here. We could put a u right here also. u equals that if you want to each time. But So the inner function, what's on the inside? So the inside here is 6x. I'm just going to do all the inside functions first. So hopefully uh, you can follow along and do that. So the inside function here, this should be pretty, pretty nice. Now this one's a little bit trickier. And so what we might want to do with this is rewrite it. That's a notational thing, so we don't get confused about what's being squared. We don't want to put a squared over here because that would be x squared. So if you think about this, this is really the tangent of x 
squared like that. And now it should be really clear what the inside is versus the outside. Okay, so the inside is going to be the tangent of x. Now we come back here and we're going to replace those with u. So this is going to be the sine of u. This is going to be u squared. It is so important that you utilize that pause and do as much of this yourself as you can. Anybody could copy this down. Anybody could play this video and copy this down on here. That doesn't mean that we know that they know anything. Okay. I used to use that example. Did they teach Japanese next door? I could go into her classroom and I could copy, maybe, that might be kind of hard if you've seen Japanese letters, but um, I have characters. I could possibly, probably copy what's on the board. That doesn't mean I know Japanese. So use that pause feature to, uh, oh, see, and I was going, this is uh, u to the fifth, actually. It's fifth power. This one is u squared. All right. So that's kind of an introduction. Now we're going to do the chain rule. This is the only really thing you're supposed to learn today, and we're going to practice it with this lesson. So the chain rule is the derivative of a composite function. If you see an inside and an outside, you're using the chain rule. Okay? So this, I haven't seen this in a long time. Uh, when I was in school, they had this uh, notation, uh, f of g of x, and we really bypassed it. As soon as we saw that, we converted it to this. And I don't even see this anymore, but maybe, I don't know. If you go to college, maybe you'll see that again. Um, so it's this one. The one that's closer to the x is the one that's inside. So it kind of just falls really nicely into that. Um, basically, you can just kind of go like this. And yeah, it's the same thing. So when we have that situation, when we have f of g of x, we're going to take the um, we're going to take the derivative of the outside, but we're going to leave the inside alone. It's going to stay there. So we're going to take the derivative of the outside, and then leave the inside, and then we're going to multiply by the derivative of the inside. Now that may seem compl sound complicated, seem complicated, but um, it's not really. Um, so, in this lesson, the rest of these problems, they're not highlighted, but they're, they're all test questions. So, when, when all of a, almost all of a chapter or a lesson is test questions, like it seems redundant to highlight them all, but if you want to highlight them all, you can. Okay, so find, you can barely see it there, there's a prime right there. Find C prime of C of X equal to this using the chain rule. So, this is the one we were looking at up top there. So, we're supposed to start by taking the derivative of the outside. So the derivative of the outside is our function cubed. So if we bring that down, that'd be 3. The inside stays the same, and then we subtract 1 from that. So that's pretty simple, hopefully, I think, feel that way. And then we want to multiply by the derivative of the inside. And that's pretty simple also. The derivative of the inside is 2x. And so now if we put that together, we get 6x. And if you go back and compare that to number 1, you will see that's the same. Okay? So I think we all agree that this is much preferable to this. And we can make that way, way more. We can make that to the 30th power. And then that would be a nightmare to do this way. We could, but... All right. So... Outside, inside. Pause that up and uh, get going. You should be able to do most, probably all of those, but go one at a time. Pause it, do it, check it. You could even do a step at a time. So you could pause this, do the first step, and then see if that matches. Okay, so hopefully you're coming back now and you've already done this. You're going to bring the two down, that derivative of the outside, and plus one, and that would be to the first power. So that's first step, and then you're going to multiply by the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of that, 2 times 3, 6, take 1 away from there. And then we're going to put that, uh, multiply those two together. And there you go. And hopefully you're like, yeah, this is nice, I, no problem here. Okay, pause.
and you're back. So the derivative of sine is cosine. You have to memorize those trig derivatives. You should have had them memorized already. Memorize trig derivatives. I should have paused that while I was writing it. Okay. So now that's the derivative of the outside. Now we need to multiply it by the derivative of the inside. Now I would put that in front so that nobody gets confused and thinks it's part of this cosine of this angle right here. So the derivative of that is going to be 2x plus 1. And like I said, I'm going to write that in front to avoid any confusion. Okay? Memorize the trig derivatives. The chain on the side is just because we're learning about the chain rule. It has no other significance. All right. Now... We could use the quotient rule here, but because that's a 1, actually, this is a rewrite situation. Remember, I put a heart when oh, so I love rewriting stuff because it makes stuff a lot easier usually. So that's going to be to the negative third power. And now we can just use the chain rule on that. So pause. And be careful, subtract 1. So negative 3 minus 1, that's negative 4. And then the derivative of the inside is 2. So if we multiply those two together, that's going to be negative 6. And then we're going to drop this back down and put a positive 4 on that. So if you're not feeling pretty comfortable with this, uh, that's, uh, I don't know, it's not a good sign. This is so far pretty nice. Um, some of the harder ones people get uh, stuck on, but for the most part, should be nice. Okay, so this is, looks like it could get a little dicey here. So, use a different color on this. Alright, so the outside is just the fifth power. So that's going to be uh, 5 times 2x plus 1 over 2x minus 1 to the fourth power. So that first step is pretty nice. But now, now we have to go inside and we have to do the derivative of that. So we're going to multiply by, uh, we're going to use the quotient rule. So that's going to be low d high. So d high is just times 2 minus high d low, that's times 2, over. So you just want to go one step at a time. Don't let it be intimidating or whatever. Okay. So... If we simplify that numerator, probably some stuff's going to cancel because in calculus a lot of stuff cancels. So that's going to be 4x minus 2. That's going to be minus 4x minus 2. And sure enough, those cancel. And that reduces kind of nicely. So that's going to be negative 4. So I'm going to have negative 4 times 5. So that's going to be negative 20. Now, I notice these denominators are the same, so I'm going to split this up, and I'm going to do 2x plus 1 to the 4th, and then down here, this is to the 4th times to the 2nd, that's the same base, so you add the exponents, so that's going to be 2x minus 1 to the 6th. Now, so the algebra can get a little hairy in there and uh, cause some problems, but uh, try and go one step at a time. So the power chain rule, it's basically just saying the same thing. So if you have this function to a power, you're going to bring the power down, multiply it, subtract one from the power, and then you're going to multiply by the derivative of the inside. So I don't know why they list this as a separate thing. It's pretty much the same thing. Okay? So always pause and try to do stuff yourself here. Both of these are going to be rewrite situations. Rewriting both of those. That's to the one-half power. And this one over here, that's going to be negative 2, 6x minus 1 to the negative one-fourth power. Now, Normally, I suggested not doing that. We're not turning this into the product rule. That's not the product rule. 
Uh, some students use the quotient rule on this. You can when you take, uh, so it's low d high. d high is zero, so it cancels out. So I've never seen a situation where I thought that was better. Well, I don't know about never, but I don't remember. Uh, usually when people try to get fancy like that, they mess that up. So coming back to this problem, I don't know why I did two problems at the same time there, but be, if I could get both hands going and do two problems, that would be pretty impressive. All right. I can't not do that, by the way. Okay, so bring the exponent down, multiply. So that's going to be negative 5 halves. And then we have x squared minus 4x plus 1. And now we subtract 1 half minus 1 is neg negative 1 half. And then we have to use the chain rule. So that was the power rule. Now we're using the chain rule. So we're going to go inside and we're going to take the derivative of that. So that's going to be 2x minus 4. All right. Now, how much of this do I want to try to do in my head? I'm going to factor a 2 out of here and cancel it with that 2. So that's going to leave me with negative 5 in the numerator. And I factored a 2 out of here, so that's going to be x minus 2. And the negative exponent is going to drop that down, and that doesn't factor. And I think I'm going to write that as a square root just because I feel like it. So, all right. So here, bring the power down, multiply that. That's going to be one half. And then inside stays the same. And then subtract one from that. That's going to be to the negative 5 fourths. And then that's the derivative of the outside. Now you've got to multiply by the derivative of the inside. The derivative of the inside is going to be 6. So that's going to be 3. 6 times 1 half. And then this is going to drop down. And that's the fifth power and the fourth root. So I'm going to write the fourth root of 6x minus 1 to the fifth. Um... All right, so I'm going to continue on here. This is the third time that this is uh, showing up in the notes. It's on the 2008 exam, number 25. And so I hope you can all pause this and do this right now. I'm pretty sure this has come up three times. There was one I was supposed to go back and do. I hope I went back and did that. I need to remember to check that later. Okay, so one of the things we want to do is when we see something's differentiable, we want to, in the problem, say, uh, draw an arrow, therefore, or something, draw an arrow, say it's continuous. If it's differentiable, we know it's continuous. Put that in your work, because there's a place where it comes up, and you'll lose a point if you don't have it. All right, so we want to do two things here. So the first thing, since it's continuous, these two should meet at the boundary. So if you plug two in there, that's going to be, uh, so first of all, let's practice writing our limit notation. So we're taking the limit as x approaches 2 from the left, and that's up here, and we're going to put cx plus d. Some of you don't write, like writing some stuff down, but on the AP exam, they're checking for this, and it's easy. So we want to make sure that we write it down now, so that when we get to the AP test, we haven't done it ever, and then we forget to do it. All right? So, oh, I don't really want that equal sign there right now. We are going to set them equal, but the thing is we're comparing these right now. So now we're going to take the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. If this was not a piecewise function, I could just write f of x right here. But because these are different pieces, I actually cannot just write f of x there. So now I have those two, and I'm going to plug 2. I'm going to let x approach 2. So that's going to be 2c plus d. And I'm going to let x approach 2 here. That's going to be 4 minus 2c. Okay. And if we want to... Well, let's see what we get for the derivative before we start adjusting. So I can see I have two variables there. Now I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to take the derivative of x... And that's going to be, the derivative of this is going to be c 
and the derivative of this can be zero. The derivative of this is going to be 2x, and the derivative of this is going to be uh, minus c. Okay? So, for the derivative to exist at the point, the derivative must be equal on both sides too. So, c has to equal 2x minus c. Except, actually, this has to happen at 2 also. So we could plug 2 in for x. So it's actually going to be That's going to be 4, add that over there. So that's going to be 2c equals 4, so c equals 2. All right, so since we know what c is, we can solve this for d. Might as well. So d is 4 minus 4c. And c is 2, so we have 4 minus, okay, yeah, kind of. I like that. 4 minus 4 times 2. So that's 4 minus 8, which is negative 4. So C is 2, D is negative 4. So 2 plus negative 4 is negative 2, which is B. All right? Should be the third time we've done that. So you guys should know how to do that. If you don't, go back and redo those. So now we just have a couple multiple choice questions. These are from the 2003 exam. So just showing you that there are AP questions you can do already just three weeks into school or four week, next week's fourth week, technically. So um, on the side here, this doesn't match up exactly because I edit the notes, but I didn't go in and edit these numbers. So, I was about to say the page numbers might be different, but I already fixed them pretty much. So that top one is just out, page 22. These are from the notebook. Page 22 in the notebook, example number 5. Page 22 in the notebook, example number 6. Page 25 in the notebook, example number 3, etc. Those are page numbers for, and example numbers for stuff that I've put on a test, test 1-4 fourth test of the so pretty much that's one of the big ways I make a test is I go through the notes and I pick the questions that I said were test questions or vice versa or I took them from the test and put them in the notes but all right so 2003 you guys were all uh, well most of you were maybe born that year possibly the year before but or the year after juniors so anyway um, chain rule, You're just taking the derivative. So that's going to be 2 times taking the derivative of the outside, and then that would be to the first power, times the derivative of the inside. I hope you pause that. So that's 6x squared. So there we go. So you can see how there are easy questions on the AP test. All we need to do is get practice, get familiar, and you can all pass this test. And some of you will never have to take math, math again in your life. Some of you are going to go on and do lots of stuff with math. So, all right. Now, we have a couple things going on here. So first of all, we have the product rule. So we're going to use the product rule first. We have this times this. So the derivative of that is going to be 2x so it's the derivative of the first thing times the second thing plus the first thing times the derivative of the second thing. And the reason this is in this section is because we have to use a chain rule on that. So the derivative of the outside is going to be cosine, and the inside stays the same. And then you have to multiply times the derivative of the inside, which would just be 2. All right. So you may want to rewrite that, get a better idea. Um, some of these look fat, the, the bigger ones look factored. So I'm going to go ahead and they all have a 2x. So I'm going to go ahead and factor out a 2x out of this. Just thinking that that will help me narrow down my selection here. So factoring the 2 out and an x out, that just leaves me with 1x. 
like that. Okay, so let's compare it here. Okay, so what one of the things that happens is people get careless when they're going fast and when they think they're smart, and that's nice if you're smart, but don't don't waste points because you're going too fast. Oh, that's easy. Boom. There it is. It's not. It's missing an X. That's not right. Okay. Down here, this looks better. Okay, so it's down here. All right. So, last thing here. This is just telling us to do part A and part B. So here's a free response question. So I think this might be one of the first free response questions we've done, maybe. Um, actually, I need to go back and do the free response question from the notes right before this. Um, I was running out of time, so I get kicked out of school. Um, I get kicked out of school most days. So, um, here we go. This is from the 2002 exam. Uh, so, I, uh, none of you should have been born at that point, I don't think, because that would have been uh, like May of 2002. Uh, and so, there may be some of you who were born later in the year 2002, but uh, if you were born, yeah, it doesn't matter. All right, let's go back to this. So, this is a free response question. On the AP test now, there are two uh, calculator free response questions and four non-calculator free response questions. Uh, and each question is worth nine points, and so there's usually multiple parts. The parts are not necessarily uh, connected to each other. They're connected to the, the beginning part. So if, if it's possible that you might not be able to do part A, but you might be able to do B, C, and D. So don't get discouraged if you don't know one part. The key is to get as many points as possible. So, an object moves along the x-axis with the initial position of z x of 0 equals 2. So that's uh, 0, 2 are the coordinates of that point. The velocity of the object when t is greater than or equal to 0 is given by this formula, the velocity. So now, part A says what is the acceleration? So that should be... Uh, a pretty easy thing to do because you should know that the acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So we want the acceleration at 4. That will be equal to the derivative of the velocity at 4. So if we take the derivative of this, uh, v prime of t, that's going to be the derivative of the outside Again, pause, do it yourself, practice, um, cosine uh, pi over 3 times t. And then you have to use a chain rule. That's why I put this question in this section, because this section is about the chain rule. And so then we have to multiply by the derivative of that, which I would put in front. Like I said before, I don't want to cause any confusion about what's with the angle and what's not with the angle. So I'll put that in front there. So... Now we're going to evaluate that at 4. So that's going to be pi over 3 cosine, and we have pi over 3 times 4. So that's going to be 4 pi over 3. So if you use a unit circle, it's cosine, so it's going to be the x-coordinate. So pi over 3 is up here, 2 pi over 3 is there, 3 pi over 3, which is just pi, is over here. 4 pi over 3 is down here. So in my mind, and if you can't do it in your mind, you could draw this picture. But in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, it's down there. And cosine is x. So that's the, the small number. There's a big number and a small number. The big number is root 3 over 2, and the small number is 1 half. Uh, the other three numbers are 0, root 2 over 2, and 1. I think those are all pretty obvious. If they're not, I'll go over them with you. Let me know. But anyway, so cosine is the x-coordinate. That is shorter than this. That means the number I want is 1 half, but it's to the left here, so it's negative 1 half. So I've got pi over 3 times negative 1 half. So that's going to be negative pi over 6. That's the acceleration. There were no units given. So... And it doesn't say indicate units of measure. So that's all we need to do there. Okay? Now, part B. Consider the following statements. 
four time from three to 4.5, the velocity of the object is decreasing. Okay. How would we know that? So if we test uh, t equals 3, the acceleration is this formula right here. So if we plug 3 in there, we would have pi over 3 times the cosine of pi. And the cosine of pi is negative 1, so that's going to be negative pi over 3. Okay, and if we test, that's just supposed to be a t. Uh, 9 over 2, 4.5 is 9 over 2. We would have the pi, pi over 3 times the cosine, and that would be uh, 3 pi over 2. And 3 pi over 2, cosine of 3 pi over 2, that's 270 degrees. That's straight down here. That x coordinate is 0. So that's 0. So pi over 3 times 0 is 0. Okay. So if you think about cosine uh, going from pi to 3 pi over 2, it's negative the whole way, which means that this is going to be negative this whole way in there, which means the acceleration is negative. And since the acceleration is negative, that means that, so it says is either or both these statements correct? For each statement provide a reason why it's correct or not. So statement one is true because the acceleration is less than zero on the interval from 3 to 9 halves. So if the acceleration is negative, that's going to be slowing you down. When I throw the pen up in the air, the acceleration is negative, and so it's slowing the object down. Okay? Now, is the speed of the object increasing? Now oh, it says the speed of the object is increasing. So we need to look for speed. The acceleration and velocity have to have the same sign. So if we look at this, the sign of pi over 3 times 3 and at 3, then that's the sign of pi. The sign of pi is 0. Then if we think about the sign of pi over 3 times uh, 9 over 2, we're going to get the sine of 3 pi over 2. Sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1, which means that this is going from 0 to negative 1. That means it's going to be negative. So the velocity is less than 0 on that interval. So they're both acceleration and velocity are both negative, so the speed is increasing, speed, absolute value of velocity. That's true because um, v of t and a of t have the same sign on the interval from 3 to 9 over 2. And that wraps those up.